All right. So here we go. This is our second lecture on North America. So eighth grade, maximum of 40 minutes. Watch all the way to the end. Everything I said for the last lecture, that's correct for this one as well. So this is chapter 15, North America, the land of opportunity, part two, which would be from page 356 to page 363. And this is basically the founding of the United States, um, that part of the chapter. This is the book that we're using. If this isn't your book, you're not watching the right lecture. So if you're following along in the book, this is the section that is entitled, The Colonies Go to War. If you are not following along in the book, that's okay. So last time we left off with there being a problem in the English speaking colonies, right? What exactly was the deal? Why would a tax cause a group of people who are subjects of the king to suddenly say, you know what, actually we've changed our mind and we would like to risk our lives fighting the largest empire in the world so that we don't have to pay taxes. That really seems pretty crazy, especially when it's a very small amount. You can see on the poster, it's three cents per pound um, or three pennies per pound rather. That's not very much. So what was going on? So we back up just a little bit from 1754 to 1763. Um, the British had been fighting a war against the French. In Europe, it's called the Seven Years War. Here we call it the French and Indian War. Those are the same war, okay? And the fight was who's gonna control what in North America? Um, it, primarily, they were fighting over uh, places that are now in Canada and around the Great Lakes in um, Upper New York. And during this war, quite a few Americans, quite a few colonists, who are British citizens, right, had fought for the British, okay, and died for the British. And this includes famous people like George Washington. He worked for the British Army in this war against the French. Um, so that had gone on seven years of war, and it was very expensive, very, very difficult for both the, the English and the French to fight this war way over on a different continent. And to help pay for it, the British government raised taxes to help um, pay, um, pay back all the debt that they had incurred while they were fighting this war. And they especially taxed the colonies because their argument was, well, we fought this war for land that you guys are now using, so you should pay taxes. And the colonists' response was, we didn't elect any of you that represent us in parliament. You know, we don't have any real representation. It's unjust to tax us. Um, besides, they said, we're the, one that we, <laughs> we're the ones that did all the fighting. Um, we still live in danger from the French and the Indians. And um, you're not in danger. You're just getting all the benefit of these raw materials and new land. And so the colonists' perception of whether or not it was fair to be taxed and the Crown's perception of whether or not it was fair to tax them, obviously very different. Speaking of the Crown, here he is. Um, this fellow, gorgeous George, George III, of England is now the king and he becomes really a symbol of tyranny for the American colonists uh, even though it was really his father and grandfather that had set up a lot of these policies that he's going to say hey well you know what I'm the king and I'm not really into politics but if this is the job I've got I'm gonna be a king about it and so he becomes very unpopular in the United States so um, what happens after that? So the war ends in 1763 and this, this taxation policy begins. And by 1774, there have been groups of British colonists in North America, the people that we're gonna start calling Americans, meeting in small groups in their towns, in their villages. And they form a couple different organizations. One of them is called the Sons of Liberty. Um, there are others that have different names. And they're just starting to discuss among themselves, okay, we don't like this situation. What are we going to do about it? How are we going to protect ourselves? And eventually these meetings get big enough that they start sending representatives from their meetings to bigger meetings. And in 1774, one of these groups is formed. They meet at Philadelphia and they call themselves the Continental Congress. And they basically form a government and the whole government is just dedicated to solving this problem of taxation and what they feel is unjust treatment by the British Empire. So they do form a government 
and the government's job is to figure out how to fix the taxation problem. And what happens? The fighting begins. Now, this chapter that we're in is, is the history of, of North America, right? And it's just an overview. It's not all of U.S. history, but we are going to talk about um, some important stuff. And basically from here on out, you're going to see that when we say North America, we really do mean the United States for most of the time. Um, and we'll talk about why as we get toward the end of this. Now, I love maps. Um, if you're not tired of me saying I love maps, then I'm not saying it enough. Um, this is not a great map because there's really too much information on it, but we're going to use it. We're going to keep coming back to it to try and understand sort of what happened in the American Revolution, just moving very quickly, and how that impacts the, the growth of uh, settlement in North America and the founding of the United States. So the first battles of what turns into the American Revolution happened in Massachusetts in April 1775. So I mentioned these groups of colonists have been meeting in their towns. And one of the things that they had done was begun to um, begin to gather weapons and ammunition and begin to train themselves in case it came to a fight between the colonists and British soldiers. All right. So what happens? Well, naturally, what would you do if you were the king? He sends soldiers to the colonies. Um, and these British soldiers are sent to Boston. And their task is to go inland to a town called Concord in um, about, it's not very far, about 20 miles from, from Boston, and seize this armory where the colonists had been gathering weapons. Okay, so the British land at Boston, which is kind of covered up by that red thing right now, and they're supposed to be going um, inland to Concord. This is how we get the story of you-know-who, right? We all know about Paul Revere. So Revere was waiting for news of the British soldiers landing. They, everybody knew they were coming. And when they land, he rides from Boston to Concord, and he warns all those little groups of colonists, every little village and town he goes through, he calls the colonists and says, he literally says, the British are coming, right? It's, it's a little dramatic. And if you've read Longfellow's poem, it's really, it's really exciting. Um, but, um, that's what's happening. The British are coming. <laughs> it's very simple. Um, so these militia men, or sometimes they're called minute men, because supposedly they were able to respond to an emergency in a minute, right? Um, why so fast? Well, they're also the fire department, <laughs> so they need to be ready at a moment's notice. Um, so he gets ahead of the British. Um, he warns all these minute men, all these militia men in the towns, and so they are waiting when the soldiers arrive. And there are two separate battles. Um, there's one on a bridge uh, in Lexington and then on the green at Concord. These are the first two battles of the American Revolution. Okay, back to the map. Um, the red thing that I pointed out a minute ago, that's the Battle of Bunker Hill. And that is a British victory. We'll talk about why. Um, first of all, it wasn't actually fought on Bunker Hill. <laughs> it was hot on, fought on the next hill over called Breed's Hill. But that's not as interesting. So we just call it Bunker Hill. Um, the revolutionaries had, had besieged Boston. They had surrounded it, and they trapped the British soldiers in the city. And so it takes a lot of time. But the British eventually do actually win this battle. They get all the colonists off the hill, out of town, and they're able to move supplies in and out of Boston again. Um, but it cost them almost 40% of the men in Boston. It, that's how many casualties the British have. So it's actually a huge moral victory for the colonists. Okay, what does moral victory mean? That means it was a sign that they could succeed. It was a sign, a sign of success, of hope, right? That they were able to inflict so much damage on one of the greatest armies in the world. Um, so even though the British won the, the ground, they were the ones standing on the battlefield at the end of the day as the winners. This was an important moment for the colonists. And then not really, not very much happens at all in terms of battles for quite a while, several, several months. Um, this is a civil war, okay? You've got a, a government and then people rebelling against the government. Um, but the revolutionary force is so small and lots of the soldiers are also farmers or they own, their craftsmen, they own little shops and they have to go back and, and survive. They have to run their farms and run their businesses. They're not gonna have, you know, not be able to buy food. 
Okay, and the British Army is very far from home and it's small, and they don't really know how they're going to deal with this America problem yet either. So not very much happens. Time goes by. The next summer, and on uh, July of 1776, the colonists make it point blank, crystal clear, absolutely no question in anybody's mind. They were going to do something the king could not ignore. Okay, they declare their independence. Okay, this is um, part of the this is the first part of the Declaration of Independence. Okay, the king is losing control of his entire North American empire. He's got to do something. Um, so what does he do in response to this? Um, he reinforces the British army and they actually drive the colonists out of New York City, out into Pennsylvania, and they win um, a series of battles, kind of push the American back. Which brings us to December. Of 1776 and a truly amazing event which usually we're gonna see represented by this um, maybe the most made fun of picture in all the history of American art right who stands in a boat like this hey, what what is that okay is this even a flag they had then uh, has no one taught that guy how to use an oar um, why is it so bright isn't this nighttime um, you get the point this is a painting of Washington crossing the Delaware. So um, in the middle of the night on Christmas Eve, Washington left his encampment west of Philadelphia and brought troops to the Delaware River and crossed it um, through the ice in the middle of the night. And they surprised the British garrison at Trenton, New Jersey. And then they followed that up with a victory against a different British force at Princeton, New Jersey, which is nearby the next week. And this forces the British to retreat all the way back into New York where they had been. So this um, frees the city of Philadelphia, which had become sort of like the American capital. It's not really a capital yet, but that's where they're having all their meetings. Back to the big map. Um, throughout 1777, there are some battles fought in New York, mainly upstate New York. Um, if you haven't already figured out, this is kind of a slow moving war. Uh, if you're used to, um, for example, the Civil War, there's a new battle every few weeks. Here we're going months before things happen. Um, eventually, the British Army that's in New York surrenders at Saratoga in October. It was very, very difficult for this big traditional army this, um, to maintain their supplies and be able to communicate with one another over these bad roads, and especially being very far from the sea. The British armies were accustomed to getting their supplies from, from the Navy, from the, the ocean. The things were brought into harbors, and campaigning was done as close to the water as possible because carrying things over land is almost impossible. Well, they can't do that here, um, so the army has a hard time keeping up with these smaller, more lightly equipped American forces, so they lose. Um, but the Americans are not winning overall. They are losing men. Uh, they don't have the equipment they need. They have a lot of problems. So they're really in a very bad spot. They win these little victories, um, but the strategy is not working out in their favor until 1778 and 1779. Two important things happen. First, the Marquis de Lafayette, this guy on the left, agrees to bring a French force and ally with the Americans. All right. The French think it is super, super awesome that the British might be losing one of these huge overseas colonies. So they are all about helping the colonists win against their traditional enemy. The, the British and the French don't tend to get along. All right. Um, at the same time, by 1779, the colonists have finally gotten their feet under them in terms of starting a navy. So I mentioned the armies are dependent on the British Navy. Well, now the Americans have a navy that's going to start to make it very difficult for the British to supply their troops. And um, this picture is of John Paul Jones, who's the first leader of the American Navy. So these two men, Lafayette and John Paul Jones, in completely, totally different ways, provide another way of making things difficult for the British. OK, so Washington has his armies. They've always been there. These two are going to add something new that the British will not be able to overcome okay if you're using your book I am now at the section that says a new nation 
1781, the Continental Congress meets again. They've been meeting off and on. They meet again and they sign the first document that tries to explain how these states are going to rule themselves, how they're going to become a government. Okay, um, and these are the Articles of Confederation. Articles of Confederation and Perpetual Union. So they, know, they now no longer call themselves colonies. They call themselves states and they describe how they're going to be related to one another. Now, what do they call themselves first? They call themselves a confederation, right? Like confederate, okay, we all, we've heard this word before, right? A confederation is a group of independent entities which agree to work together, to cooperate, to have some kind of shared, all right, I will do my thing and you will do your thing, but if we need to work together, here's how we're gonna do it. And that's what the Articles of Confederation are. So these are signed in 1781. And in October of 1781, the last of the, ba the major British armies surrenders at Yorktown in Virginia. So this is Washington receiving uh, Lord Cornwallis's sword. And that's the end of the war as far as the, this is it. Okay, the British armies give up, maintain this. All right, and what happens after that? Six years of almost nothing. There's a lot of back and forth. Um, there are delegations, there are diplomatic things that go on between the colonists who are now the Americans, right? Or the United Statesians. Why don't we get, why don't we say United Statesian, right? Between the colonists and the, the empire. What, how is the king gonna recognize this? How is he gonna do that? And so on and so forth. It takes six years of all of that, plus just recovering from a war in general. Um, but by 1787, the Continental Congress has ended its debates, and the thing that makes it all stop is the signing of a constitution. Okay, so the Articles of Confederation, where this is how we're going to do what we're going to do, the constitution is, is a legally binding document. It was ratified, that is, it was sent out to each of the states, and they voted to accept it and commit themselves to abiding by it. Okay, this is the document that explains, all right, we will rule ourselves, we will do it this way, we will all do it this way, and um, they create this government. So it's called a constitutional republic, right, because the individual states who agreed to join are semi-independent, that's what makes them a republic, and their ruling document is called a constitution. Okay. Ta-da! That's actually it. So this one was short. Um, it was, I couldn't put the American Revolution and the Civil War together. <laughs> so this one is short. The next one will be short as well. Just like I said in the first one, make sure that you understand. I did not take all these pictures. I did not paint that painting of Washington standing up in the boat, right? These are not my maps. These are things that come from the internet and other people's hard work and creativity. So be sure you check them out. Um, I did, since I've got the time, I'll go ahead and explain. So Wikimedia, is we all know what Wikipedia is, right? It's an encyclopedia. Wikimedia is a collection of artwork and maps and graphics and photographs that have their source information included in their web page. So for example, the painting of Washington crossing the Delaware, it has the painting, it has the author or the artist of the painting, the year it was painted. If we know the place, that's included. All of that information that tells you, okay, if I'm going to share this picture, I can now tell you who painted it and when, and whether it's owned by an art gallery, where where in the world is it located, and things like that. I really, really like the Wikimedia site because it does help you make sure you're looking at the right thing. If you just Google image things, um, you will there will be mistakes. Um, this is especially difficult with art, with religious art, like every painting of Mary. It's like, this is the Madonna by whatever. That's not always accurate. Um, so going to Wikimedia, you have a lot more careful catalog of these images. So I, that's why it's at the top of all my source lists. And then maps are National Geographic, Britannica, and I did use your book. So there you go, I kept it under 20 minutes. There will be one more lecture in the North America slides and that will be the one that does um, the 1800s and the 1900s um, and kind of gets us to the modern era and finishes out the chapter. So thank you very much for watching.